for coming today. Father Casey Beaumier might be a familiar face, especially to anyone who lives in Fenwick Hall, because that's where Father Casey lives and serves as a mentor for students. He received his PhD in religious history from Boston College and focused his dissertation on the development of Jesuit education in the 20th century. He is the director of the newly established Institute for Advanced Jesuit Studies at Boston College, a new initiative at Boston College that seeks to promote the Society of, Je of Jesus's history, spirituality, pedagogy, and leadership within Jesuit apostolates. Father Casey is one of nine children. He is actually number six of nine, and one of his favorite, favorite things to do is canoe. He recently penned a book that is being released on April 1st by Loyola Press called A Purposeful Path. You'll get a sneak peek tonight. And so now we'd like to welcome up Father Casey. So after that nice introduction, I do want to say that uh, I hope you buy the book, right? <laughs> it's on my feast date, April Fool's Day, that it'll be released. I'm a, I'm a prankster. I love April Fool's Day. So here's a copy of it. And if you look online, you'll be able to find it. I don't want to tell you the whole story tonight because I want you to read the book, but I want to tell you enough so that you might be interested in getting the book. So I'm in a little bit of a dilemma because it's a story that I wrote for you. When I was in college in 1993, or 1989 to 1993, I was at Marquette U in Milwaukee. So I went to a Jesuit university just like you go to and I know that we have a number of guests from other schools who are here with us at Agape Latte tonight. So to be at Boston College is to attend a Jesuit university. And my story is about the fruit of a Jesuit education, at least in terms of what I experienced. And I, I wrote it because I'm hoping that we share that common heart of what it is that education can do for us. So that's, that's at the heart of what I want to talk about tonight. And I hope that it relates directly to what you and I do each day here at Boston College. When I was a freshman, we had a core, just like you do. And I had a core English class. It was composition. And in the second semester, we read the autobiography of Maya Angelou. And I loved this autobiography. My life is very different from Maya Angelou, very different. But I love stories of survival. I love stories that are sincere. And her autobiography, for some reason, had such compunction in my heart that it stayed with me. And it motivated the way that I grew at the Jesuit University. It helped influence the, the major that I chose which was journalism, because in that composition class, we had to write a big paper, and I wrote about her and some motivation that I had from reading her story. Well, when I was at Marquette, I fell in love with the Society of Jesus. So I didn't become a journalist. I became a Jesuit, right? I just like Jays, right? <laughs> so I, I had a great mentor in the dorm in which I worked as an RA, and my mentor is our president, Father Leahy. Father Leahy's known me since I was 19 years old, so he's got a lot of stuff on me, right? <laughs> but he's a tremendous priest, a great listener, and I would go to see him for all sorts of advice. He just had a tremendous capacity to be present, and he cares for students. And I loved the example that he was for me in college and somehow God used that good example of a priest, and I decided I wanted to become a Jesuit. So I entered the society right out of college, and that's where the story begins. When one is a, a novice in the society of Jesus, there's a two-year ex experience of being a novice, and a novice is a beginner, right? When you enter the Jesuits, you have two years where there are all sorts of experiments that help you discern is this the right life for me? One experiment that we do is the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, and that's a 30-day silent retreat. And at that time, we made that retreat in, in Denver, and we keep silence the whole time. It's a marvelous experience. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, received the exercises, 
and all Jesuits make the exercises at the beginning of their training, and then they do that every year over an eight-day retreat. Well, this 30-day retreat for me was lovely. It was a great experience. And in the afternoons, I would go to make some physical exercise at the YMCA in Denver. And I would walk back to the Jesuit community in silence. And sometimes I would stop by a bookstore called Tattered Cover. And one day, toward the end of the 30-day retreat, I entered the Tattered Cover to do a little spiritual reading in a different venue, and I saw a display for a new book written by Maya Angelou called Wouldn't Take Nothing for My Journey Now. And I remembered how much I liked her when I was an undergraduate. So for some reason, I picked up a copy of this book from the display, and I opened it to a section that was titled The Power of the Word. And I liked that title because I was hungry for words, right? I was keeping quiet all this time. So I liked the title and I sat down and what happened was I had this incredible convergence of what I was going through precisely at that moment in the spiritual exercises and how she described what happened in her own life. There was this great communion of the power of words. She wrote this, in my 20s in San Francisco, I was a sophisticate and an acting agnostic. It wasn't that I had stopped believing in God. It was just that God stopped frequently, frequenting the places I lived. One day, a teacher, Frederick Wilkerson, asked me to read to him. I was 24, very erudite, very worldly. He asked that I read from Lessons in Truth, a book published by the Unity Book, the Unity School of Christianity, a section which ended with these words, God loves me. I read the piece and closed the book. And the teacher said, read it again. I pointedly opened the book and I sarcastically read, God loves me. He said, again. After about the seventh repetition, I began to sense that there was some truth to the statement, that there was a possibility that God really did love me, me, Maya Angelou. I suddenly began to cry at the grandness of it all. For I knew that if God loved me, I could do wonderful things. I could try anything, achieve anything. For what could stand against me with God? Since one person, any person with God, constitutes the majority. Here's where it gets good. <laughs> that knowledge humbles me, melts my bones, closes my ears, and makes my teeth rock loosely in their gums. It also liberates me. I'm a big bird winging over high mountains, down into serene valleys. I am ripples of waves on silver seas. I'm a spring leaf trembling in anticipation. So here I am in this bookstore. And this woman, in writing, has just articulated for me the very heart of what I was receiving in my own heart. And I knew in that moment that I had to meet her. Because I knew if God could make somebody on earth who could articulate so precisely what it was that I was experiencing, then I, I needed to meet that person. Another experiment that we do as novices in the Society of Jesus is that we do a pilgrimage. In that pilgrimage, at least in the Midwest, because we're cool, <laughs> you get $30 and a one-way bus ticket 
and the Jesuits send you out for six weeks to survive. And you come back six weeks later. You're to survive by begging. I knew that my pilgrimage was to Maya Angelou. My pilgrimage wasn't to a place, but it was to a person. If I were to define what pilgrimage is, and I made this definition up, so don't look it up, but I say a pilgrimage is a personally transformative, life-changing journey of risk, renewal, and awakening wonder that always leads to a sacred center. Pilgrimage is a personally transformative, life-changing journey of risk, renewal, and awakening wonder that always leads to a sacred center. So a Jesuit's always sent. We don't make our own assignments. So I had to present this idea to the novice master, whom I love, Father Pat McCorkle. He's a great priest. So I told him about this, and he listened, and he said, why don't you investigate? Maya Angelou was the Reynolds professor at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So I was writing some letters to Wake Forest, digging up addresses, not getting any feedback. So I made some phone calls, got what I think was the English department, and asked if uh, I could come see Maya Angelou, maybe have a coffee, although I didn't drink coffee, right? And this person on the phone was like, who's this idiot? <laughs> like, I mean, who's, who's calling to meet Maya Angelou? And she said, Maya Angelou is a very busy person, and she doesn't just see people who show up. So I told the novice master that they knew I was coming. <laughs> So my, my one-way bus ticket went to the Appalachian Trail. After 24 hours on a bus, I was led to Knoxville, Tennessee. And that's the end of the line. That's not uh, exactly where Wake Forest University is. So I hiked the Appalachian Trail with a classmate uh, for about seven days or so. And we begged from people on the Appalachian Trail because in my bag, I had a blanket, uh, some shirts, couple shirts, a sweatshirt, a half roll of toilet paper, I don't know, a, <laughs> a jar of peanut butter, my contact solution, a razor, toothbrush, toothpaste. That was it. So we're on the Appalachian Trail and meeting people who were so kind to us. You know. Hikers are always carrying just what they need, so to ask them for food on the Appalachian Trail, that's like asking someone from, to give from their very basic necessity. And we were always cared for, always warmly embraced. Eventually I got to Wake Forest, and I had to, I had to meet random students. I'll tell you, it's not good for us to pass one another without acknowledgement. When we pass each other at Boston College, I think it's important to make eye contact and to say good morning, hello. There's an earth person in my midst, right? I think it's good to say hello. At Wake Forest, I was sitting out on a bench Afraid, afraid because here I am on this other campus and I, I needed help. I didn't know anything about that campus. I had to find courage to reach out to people in their passing period. Hey, are you in my Angelo's class? <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, right? Crazy. But I met marvelous people at that great university, people who were so kind. There was a woman in the dean of the college office who took me under her wing. 
and just helped me immensely. And through lots and lots of phone calls, she introduced me to a student who was the protege of Maya Angelou on that campus, Melissa Kelly, or Melissa, I forget her last name. Doesn't matter, it's in the book. <laughs> and I never met her, but I talked to her on the phone, and she worked at Maya Angelou's real office. There's a, there were decoy offices for crazy people like me. <laughs> but Melissa helped me get these real letters to Maya Angelou. That meant a lot to me. I had written these letters over the time. I had copies. She gave them to her, and then I was waiting, 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 and I never heard anything. Never heard anything, and then I, I called Melissa, and she said that Maya Angelou had to go out of town. So I, I felt like a failure. I had spent all this time in the Appalachian Trail. Here I am at Wake Forest University, bugging people, and didn't work. I, didn't, I was a failure as a pilgrim. Didn't work out. So I decided to leave and I went to Washington. I begged money from people in North Carolina, and I got money for a bus ticket, got on a bus, and went to, to Washington. And I went to Union Station, and there's a Jesuit high school called Gonzaga, right at Union Station. There's a little church there called Gonzaga. I went to Mass there, and uh, the Jesuit pastor made new people introduce themselves, and I met some other people. Some other people who turned out they were going to New York City to a Maya Angelou conference. <laughs> what? <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Crazy. So after doubting that, I said, well, she didn't want to see me. I don't want to see her. I'm not going to New York. I've never been to New York. That's crazy. So stubborn, me, I just stayed in Washington. I called the Omega Institute, which is where Maya Angelou was speaking in New York City, and I said, how much would it cost to go that one day? And he said it was like $108. I said, well, I can't afford that. Could I just, can you let me in? No. <laughs> Crazy. The night before the conference, I decided I should go to New York. So I, I get on a bus alone and go to New York. And I felt very afraid. I was sick. I had a bad cold. Some hours later, I end up in New York City. I don't know anything about where I am. And my strategy was to try to find where the Marriott Marquis was. And I, I found it. Some people pointed it out. And I decided I would just keep walking in that area until the next morning. I knew she was speaking at like 9 AM. And I said to myself, well, I'll just sneak in. <laughs> it's crazy. So I'm walking around. I go by uh, a door that says Francis Xavier. Francis Xavier is one of the founders of the Society of Jesus. It's like 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night. And I, I just leaned against this door, and it was open. <laughs> like, is this North Dakota? I mean, it's, <laughs> why aren't the doors locked? And there were. There was a nun there and two Jesuits who just happened to leave the door open and were standing in that doorway. And I stayed with them. And the next morning, I went to the Marriott and couldn't get in. <laughs> right? I was going to sneak in. And when I got there, they were setting up for the conference. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. So I tried to sneak in 
behind. I'm like looking at the walls, admiring this beautiful lobby. And this lady says, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm here to see my Angelo. And she said, where's your badge for the conference? I said, I don't have one. And she said, well, you, you have to pay to come in. I said, well, I, I can't. I, I, I don't have the money. Can you just let me in? And I said, I've been kind of chasing her around the United States. <laughs> Not a good thing to say, <laughs> stalker. So she's, she's, no, you're not coming in. Then someone else comes, and she's in agreement. And then this third lady comes, and I knew I was lousing everything up. So I looked at I knew it was my last chance. So I, I looked at her, and I said, listen, I really need to be here. I don't know why but I, I'm supposed to be here. And she's looking at me and she said, will you leave after she's done? Said, yeah. <laughs> and so she let me in. And I was the first person there. Because it was my plan was to sneak in early. So I walk in this ballroom, there's probably 1,000 plus chairs and I went to the front row. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a nice seat there and it started filling up and after some time my Angelo comes out and she gives this great presentation reflection of her poetry she speaks of her life it was just a lovely lovely moment I don't know when you're in the presence of a living word it does something to the heart And she kept going, she finishes, and I'm sitting there, and I had the letters, you know, I still have one. I had the letters and I, I had fancied going up and giving them to her. But when she finished, I, I didn't need to, I just sat there. I sat there, you know, like after Thanksgiving dinner and you just sit and you're just, ah, this is right and just. Because there was one thing that she said that really stayed in my heart. And she says, all my conscious life and energies have been dedicated to the most noble cause, the liberation of the human mind and spirit, beginning with my own. That's my vocation. That's my purpose. The pilgrimage for me was for those words. I'm telling you this not because it's a story about me. Because I think it's about you. I think there's a way of looking at life that reveals to us that we're all pilgrims. And I'm not saying that because we're in Massachusetts, right? <laughs> we're pilgrims. We're on a journey. And what are you carrying? What do you carry on the way? The bad spirit wants you to carry things that weigh you down things that are meant to trip you up. The voice of the accuser wants to make you feel like you're journeying all wrong. You're not doing it right. All the other pilgrims already made it. You're sitting on a bench. Voice of the accuser can have tremendous power on the way. And the pilgrim is to dismiss such a voice. You and I are in charge of what we listen to. I know that there's lots that we're not in charge of. I'm not in charge of mice. I'm not in charge of rain. I'm not in charge of missing the bus. 
There's lots that are out of my hands. Same for you. But I am in complete charge, complete control of how I react to and how I interpret all the events of my life. And that's true for you. You and I are in complete control of how we react to and how we interpret the events of our lives. And the voice of the accuser wants you to pretend that that's not true. To make you into someone who's stuck, who feels like she doesn't know where she's going, or who feels like he doesn't belong, or who feels like she somehow doesn't add up, or who feels like he's behind where everybody else is. Uh-uh. Not for the pilgrim. My advice is this. You're doing it right. You're doing it right. It's not like you have a playbook and you can look and say, here's how I did my life last time. Here's how I lived my first life. No. We're doing this on the fly. Right? We're, we're, we're pilgrims on the fly. We're trying, we're trying to get to where we're going. And why? Because we're loved. Because we're loved. So many people will talk to me about, I, I need to find out what God wants for me. I need to find out that one thing that God wants me to do. Be gentle. Be gentle in that because I don't think that that's, I don't think that's how God works. I think God's desire for us is that we receive the love of God. On the pilgrimage, God's desire is that we receive divine love. And divine love is like, it's like a jet pack, like a battery, and it propels us on the way. And I say you should go for it. What's your journey? What's your vision? I think if people stop and pause and ponder, especially in education, there are things that have happened to you here that are crucial for where you're going to go. For me, it was a freshman composition English class. What? That's crazy. Well, that's God. Go figure. It's, it's to pay attention and then to allow love to propel you in the journey and to, to not despair, to not give in to the voice of the accuser. I think that's crucially important. I'd say be kind along the way. Be kind and be gentle. Starting here. Starting here. When you blame yourself, when you alienate yourself, you get stuck. Bad spirit wants you to get stuck. Kindness and gentleness with divine love as their origin allow us to be kind and gentle along the way so that when you walk past me, I say hello. You say good morning. And we're happy because we're alive. We're alive. You're here and you're alive on the way. You're a pilgrim who's alive. And that's not a small potato. Like some people, big deal. I mean, it's day in and day out. It's not. Every day, every day is a journey. And you need a pause. You need a pause to attend to the vision. I really believe it. I believe that every person, if you sit down with someone long enough, you will discover that she or he has tremendous vision, tremendous desire. I think what happens is that people sometimes give up on their vision, on their desire. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, don't do that. It's not for you and me to decide when the vision has its time. That's God's work. But the vision does have its time. All that God asks of us is that we receive love. 
and that that propels us into the, the enfleshment of the vision. So always trust God is at work. God is at work in ways that are crazy. That don't, you just look back and you say, I couldn't have made that up. I couldn't make up my life if I tried. But I believe that God is at work in your life. God is at work in your life. Everything that has happened is the journey. Everything that has happened is in the journey for you. It's not to pick and choose. I receive it all. The good and the bad. I receive it all because I believe that it all converges. As Flannery O'Connor writes, everything that rises must converge. As Paul writes, all things work together for those who love God. It's going to work. We're going to get there. You're going to get there because you're a pilgrim. Thanks. <laughs>